just as there is rational versus irrational Christianity, there is rational versus irrational atheism. It took me a while to figure out this is the classification that I should use. In Christianity, the wide spread ideas are anti-biblical, that don't make any sense, and they are loudly trumpeted. The same thing is true in atheism, because m many, I don't know I can say most, but many atheists are irrational in their atheism just like many Christians are irrational in their Christianity. Religion in any form is irrational, and Christians in the majority, overwhelming majority, are religious. That's why they're irrational. But the same thing is true in atheism. I tried to show that when I was first covering the Berlinski piece on the devil's delusion when I was making that quote, what was it on page 5 page 5 through 8 of his book I was quoting actual atheists including Dawkins and their statements about their atheism they were praising science as if it were God and they were praising atheism as if it were the pinnacle of reason Whenever you hear people talk like that, that's religious talk. No matter what the object is that they're praising, it's religious talk. It's dogma. Whenever people get dogmatic, you know right away that they're irrational. If you are right in what you say, if what you believe is actually true, you don't need to defend it, you don't need to be dogmatic. In fact, the thing that you want, if you really know something's true, is you want to keep looking at the alternatives. Because whatever it is you know that's true, you don't know it well enough. So the last thing you are when you're certain of something is dogmatic. So dogma reflects an insecurity complex in the person who's being dogmatic. And I'm trying to show, you know, Christian versus atheist, or Christian and atheist as two sides of a coin, because really it's dividing out between the insecure versus the secure. A rational Christian is totally secure. He knows the answers. He's been there. He's done that. He's gone through all the arguments, and he, 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 he sees where the problems are, and he's comfortable. He's fought all the battles that he needed to fight. And there's a great deal of comfort that comes from really actually understanding the position that you're taking, really understanding it. But a child doesn't know how to do that. A person who hasn't fought the battles and gone through the issues doesn't know how to do that. So he lives on hearsay. And that's what a lot of atheists are doing. They wouldn't know math, genetics, or science if it bit them. But if they claim science, that makes me smart and I must be right and atheism is better because atheism is reason and religion is irrational. Well, yeah, religion is irrational, but faith is not. You can't even get up in the morning if you don't have a reason that you believe in. You can't move your fingers. You can't take a cup of coffee. You can't drive your car. Everything you do is based on faith. And faith is based on reason. You can be incorrect in your reasons, but faith can't even operate without reasons, and you can't operate without faith. So there you go. But you see, to the insecure... If atheism is good and faith is the opposite of atheism because they don't know how to think, then they have to make faith bad because they're insecure. 
And what ends up happening, unfortunately, just as in the Christian community, in the so-called atheist community, the majority of atheists who are ignorant, they they make the whole atheism thing look bad. So what's the difference between a rational and irrational atheist? It will be easier if I cover the rational atheist. And anything that I don't cover is what the irrational atheist is. Although I'll try to give some examples. A rational atheist acknowledges the problems that atheism has. Atheism cannot prove there is no God. Atheism is a belief system that there is no God, but it cannot prove its point. Atheists are constantly, you know, berating Christians. Well, you can't prove God exists. Actually, we can, but the proof we got, we can't give you. You have to get it yourself. That's the way it works. The Christian way of life is a supernatural way of life and demands a supernatural means of execution. Sorry. That's why I did my ultimate reason for atheism video. That's how it works. 24-7 I'm supposed to be online with God in my head. And you can't read my thoughts because man is immaterial. You can't read my thoughts, so you can't tell the evidence. You can't see it. All you got is my attestation. Well, that's not good enough. It isn't good enough. I don't expect it to be good enough. I have to tell you the truth, and you're not going to believe me, and I understand and accept that. That's a problem in Christianity. Mature Christians don't have a problem with the fact that it's a problem in Christianity. But it's also a problem in atheism. You can't prove there is no God. God is invisible by nature. That's why I can't prove him to you. That's also why you can't disprove him to me or to anybody else, or even to yourself. You cannot disprove God exists. God is immaterial by nature. He is supernatural by nature. So nature cannot prove that God exists. The rational atheist accepts that fact and is constantly open to any new evidence or any new mechanism of testing. That's what a rational atheist will do. He, he's more often classified as an agnostic or will describe himself as an agnostic, but in point of fact, he yet does not believe God exists. So... Atheist is, is really a proper term for him also. If you don't believe God exists, then you're an atheist. But you call yourself maybe an agnostic, and that's a, a little more specifically accurate, because you're not sure. Okay. That's objective. That's rational. That's rational atheism. A rational atheist admits that I really don't know that God doesn't exist. I can't disprove God's existence. But from what I have so far, from what I understand so far, I don't see proof he does exist either. Okay. That's, that's fair. The irrational atheist, by contrast, is not content with that sort of elasticity of doubt. The irrational atheist, like the irrational Christian, is threatened by anything that disagrees with him because his own faith in his atheism here is too weak. He needs more certitude. So he has to bang the drum that <clears throat> You know, like Richard Dawkins does in his book, God's Illusion. God is improbable because the universe is improbable. Of course, what Dawkins is doing is saying that the universe solely consists of the material universe, which you can see. It's totally ridiculous. Matter and energy is all there is, and that's improbable that it got here on its own. 
duh. And therefore, God is more improbable because Dawkins wants you to think that God, by definition, should be subject to nature. So God is only God if he's not God. That's why I know Dawkins is a scam artist. Don't even listen to him. He's just trying to make money off people. He's not even interested in proper presentation of data, ideas, philosophy, conclusions, logic, or anything else. All he wants to do is bamboozle you. It's just like the King James only leaders on the Christian side. They sell snake oil. And you're too stupid to buy it. Okay, but... A rational atheist will say... Well, it's obviously clear, obvious, that life, that the universe consists of more than matter and energy. There are too many things that are immaterial by nature that are not matter or energy, yet control matter or energy. Time is one of those things. Okay, we talk about space-time, but time itself has, is not matter or energy. All right, we measure matter and energy in terms of time, but time itself is separate from those things. If it weren't, then it wouldn't have an effect on those things. It's the same time having effect on all things, so time is a separate component from either matter or energy. That's logical. The same thing is true of life itself. It's immaterial. The same thing is true of math. It's immaterial. Time life and math affect universally affect all things but are not those things when you cut a plant or a human being dies or an animal dies all the biological components are still the same yet the person is dead how come Time goes across, you know, the whole universe. There is a second right now. That second is true across the entire universe. All right? At the same time as you can say that the universe itself occupies billions and billions maybe of light years. In other words, if I had to travel from where I am to the end of the universe, I'd be long dead before I got there. But at the same time, this moment in time is the same moment for the other end of the universe as here. I guess, I, I don't know, maybe this helps you if you think of it as bisected. Okay, the name of the moment here versus the name of the moment at the end of the universe is not the same because now we're thinking in terms of the relative value between the moment here at this point in the universe versus the moment there at that point in the universe. But it's kind of like looking at a map of the United States in two dimensions. Okay, I'm sitting in Texas, maybe you're in New York. And, um, let's see, what time is it? I'm in Texas and it's 2.43 in the morning on Saturday morning, the 14th. Okay, if you're in New York at the same time, you're an hour ahead of me. But it's still the same moment for both of us. We just call it by different names. It's still the same moment. So the name of the moment at the other end of the universe is a different name than the name of my moment in terms of my, my clock here. But it's still the same moment at the other end of the universe. You with me? Now, that means that time is independent of matter and energy, yet rules, governs matter and energy. The same thing is true of life. The same thing was true of thought. A mindless universe cannot create a minded human being. 
A mindless universe cannot create a human being capable of rejecting nature, capable of reasoning, capable of abstract thought, and all the other things that plagued Darwin in the last part of his book, Descent of Man. Poor guy died trying to figure out. He couldn't account for this. He couldn't account for the human mind. And of course, other evolutionists have had the same problem ever since. And the same thing was true as a problem that people were trying to figure out centuries ago. This issue about time, life, and the mind all being immaterial, be speaking the fact that what we call the universe cannot merely be matter and energy. This has been long known. And a rational atheist will admit that. A rational atheist will not feel threatened or nervous by the fact that there are things he can't explain. A rational atheist knows he can't explain how the universe got here, whether you call it steady state, landscape, egg, or Big Bang. If the universe was always here, why is it always here? If the universe is an egg, how'd the egg get their chicken and egg argument? If the universe is Big Bang, what caused the Big Bang? Something immaterial has to be accounting for it. So it's not matter, not energy, not natural universe. That's the only conclusion that you can logically draw. And math, in particular, helps you realize how true that is. But math is immaterial. How did math get here? You know, I want to say it was like a year or two, maybe three ago. Uh, an agnostic guy, atheist agnostic, named Symbolic. And I would try and work this through. I did some videos called the Symbolic Nine that are in my atheist playlist. I'm not so sure I did those videos very well. Symbolic is, I guess he's on vacation from YouTube or something. He hasn't been back. His channel's still active, but he's not apparently, you know, using it. Um, he and I were trying to go back and forth on this because we're both, you know, sort of math geeks. And the most he could come up with, because he's what I would consider a rational atheist, agnostic him, smiling skeptic, to some extent Phil Hillanes, to some extent Pat Condell, definitely David Berlinski. He was trying to figure out, okay, well, what if we said that math was always here and the laws of math? A rational atheist would think like that, and there are a number of them who do whether they're in cosmology or physics. I mean, there's a whole community of atheists out here who are thinking like I'm talking about right now. They just aren't getting enough press attention because they're not busy trying to promote atheism. They're trying to figure out the answers, that's all. They don't feel a need to debunk faith. They just want to know the answers. So Symbolic was trying to th figure that out too, and <clears throat> he came up with the idea that maybe math laws were always there. Okay, but the problem that I had with that, and this is important to account for, is how does personhood exist, the mind? You can see, you can start to say, well, okay, well, the structure of the mind would be reflected in these math laws because true logic in the mind it works like math does. And it's the essential foundation for math, for logic. Quine did a lot to talk about that. Um, but personhood is a definite attribute that can choose to be irrational that can choose to go against. And that's not a property of math. Math doesn't have a will, is the point. There's no personhood in math. 
You can argue that once personhood exists, that its ability to structure, its ability to function, could have been determined, so to speak, by math laws rather than God. How'd the personhood get here? Because that's immaterial, too. Nobody can measure thoughts. They don't actually they don't actually reside in the brain. They they dictate to the brain. But there's there's no you, you couldn't open up your brain like a hard drive and read thoughts on it. They don't store there. What stores there instead are sensory impressions that go with thought. Like you're having a birthday party and there's a certain smell and a look on the cake and a look on your kid's face. And all those visual, physical memories, those store in the brain. The, the, the physicality of it stores. But the actual thoughts don't. The actual memory doesn't. What basically happens is somehow the thought taps certain sections of your brain and then the memory is stimulated. That's, you know, they did experiments where they cut open heads and they probed and, you know, did little, you know, electrical nodes on parts of the brain to find out what was stored where. But they couldn't find actual memories. They were sensory impressions that went with them. So a rational atheist will admit that these problems all exist. And he doesn't know how to account for them. And he'll admit that we don't know how to account for it. We can't account for the beginning of the universe. We can't account for the mind. We can't account for um, life, which is also immaterial. We can't account for time. Those are all immaterial things. Oh, and math. Math itself is immaterial. You cannot invite the number one over for dinner. An irrational atheist is threatened by the fact that those things can't be accounted for. That's the essential difference. Rational atheists have been thinking about these things from time immemorial. And they write papers on them even to this day. One of the atheists who's, who wrote one of the most provocative things was a guy named Julian Jaynes. He wrote a book that you can get on Amazon. I think he's dead now. He used to be at Harvard. Called The Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Origin of, I think it's got the whole title. It's really long. Uh, origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. James was terrible at analyzing scripture, but then that, that's to be expected. He didn't have any idea or sense about literary, you know, the, the function of literary writing. He didn't understand Hebrew poetry and he didn't understand a whole lot of things. So he doesn't know how to read the scripture verses that he spends a lot of time on, especially in the book of Amos. But James was trying to logically work his way through how did man become conscious. See, he's trying to argue that there's a biological basis for the soul. But he, he couldn't. He tried. And even his fellows, you know, because he's an evolutionist, and his fellow evolutionists said, no, you know, this, this isn't working. But it was a good effort, and it's an interesting book. I really enjoyed reading it. Berlinski's trying to do the same thing. But he's doing it from a different standpoint. He's, he's very much into math. He's very much into physics. And he's very eclectic. He's borrowing from a wide variety of disciplines to try to account for these immaterial things. And he includes among the immaterial the whole idea of morality. Right, wrong, good, bad. Okay, he doesn't attribute that to biology. Which is laudable on his part because man's morality is way above, you know, the survival mechanism. You can argue it's rooted in it. But it's actually rooted in the desirability of associating with each other. And that's not, how do you want to call it? That's not strictly a survival instinct. 
That's something that the will wants in addition to. A higher a higher desire, a desire for the higher. Okay? A desire for a, a purpose to living. Animals don't have that. Nature wouldn't have that. Nature is mindless. Nature wouldn't ask why. Nature wouldn't ask how. Nature would just be mindless, just plugging along. There's no curiosity in a mindless nature. It just does what it does, like an automaton. So the human mind's existence cannot be explained by nature. Time cannot be explained by nature. Math cannot be explained by nature. Well, I mean, it can be explained, but it can't. The origin can't be explained. The origin of time, the mind, math, life. None of those four things. Are mass and energy but they act on it so where do they come from a rational atheist recognizes these are problems because it can point either way or at least it, it like like Berlinsky himself said and he doesn't believe in God the the data about these immaterial things and he didn't list them like I do he has its own nomenclature the data about these immaterial things suggests, that's what he uses, suggests that God in some form exists. Just suggests. Well, suggests is not enough, and, and Berlinski even says that. It's inadequate for as an explanation. So you see, rational atheism, unlike irrational atheism that makes science God, and is so threatened it has to call faith irrational even though it takes faith to say such a thing. Rational atheism accepts the fact that these things are problems and is trying to reason them out. Now Berlinski in particular is trying to figure out is there a way that the scientific community can structure tests for what's beyond nature by means of nature to back into it I mean I'm not sure how strongly he's trying to suggest it but when I read through Devil's Delusion his Devil's Delusion book which is really a, a compilation of lectures he gave that somebody told him he should put together in a book so at various points in time when he gave those lectures he was trying to suggest, you know, shouldn't we, as scientists, shouldn't we try to see if we can't define the immaterial? The problem he faces is that it's, you know, science has become religified by the Dawkins crowd to be threatened by any possible idea that it might, the data might suggest something about God. And that's kind of ludicrous because throughout history, atheists themselves, especially the physicists, are actually looking to find the face of God. That was what Einstein was looking for. That's what Hawking is looking for. The guys have said it on a number of occasions. You, I mean, I'm sure the quotes are out there on the internet. Einstein was looking for it. I have a feeling, perhaps, that Berlinski's looking for it. That to these people, to the physicists anyway, they believe that physics is beautiful. They believe cosmology is beautiful. I do too. And to them, they feel that somewhere in between the theoretical physics and quantum mechanics and all the theory that you can't see, you know, in nature but is logically implied by nature that maybe they can find God that way and maybe not maybe they find something else but well, one thing they're sure of it's going to be beautiful now as a rational atheist well does it really matter if you can start to find the immaterial you can't explain, 
one way or another, who cares where it leads? If you're a true scientist, you don't care where it leads. You're not threatened by what you find. What you're worried about is that you're going to color what you find to suit a religious agenda. And, and that's really what's behind the whole science thing, where they say, you know, we want to preclude, exclude the whole God thing. And that's the right thing to want to do. You don't want science to be religified. Science should be free from having to draw one side or the other conclusion. The trouble with science at this point is that the irrational atheists have turned it into a political football that it's only scientific if it's an atheist conclusion. Okay, well then it's bad science. A rational atheist is not worried about the outcome. A scientist in particular is, doesn't want to be worried about the outcome. He doesn't want it to favor any side but whatever the truth is. But that's not happening right now. The irrational atheists have taken over the whole science thing. I mean, it's gotten to the point now where it, you, you have to be careful what you say if you, if you have a position in you know a university or a scientific institute or something you have to be careful what you say because if what you say points at all to god then then your peers are going to you know shun you that's sick i mean it just is it's also sick if you had to believe in god in order to be a scientist and employed. It's sick either way. So the rational atheist is somebody that, frankly, I want to support. He doesn't believe in God. Well, that's his own personal journey. I don't care if he believes in God or not. What I care about is, is he willing to look at what is very clearly another type of, as it were, element this is not being looked at. Something is above nature. In the nature of time, the nature of life, the nature of the human mind, the nature of thought, the nature of math, all those things are immaterial. They are not natural. They're not biological. They are not, they control everything. They control physics. They control biology. They control just the whole universe as we know it. I mean, our minds don't control it, but our minds can perceive it. Which means that our minds are made out of the same stuff, the same immaterial stuff as time and the laws of math and life itself. So there is an affinity of nature between time, the laws of math, our thought pattern, and our human mind, the actual mind itself, which is not biological. So what, and life. So what is that? What is that shared affinity that's above nature. What is its nature? And how did it get here? And that is a proper question, I would submit. And I think Berlinski is saying the same thing from what I can tell. That's a proper question for scientific inquiry. No matter where it goes. And it's really unfair and quite frankly cheap and dogmatic and religified that the irrational atheists are trying to squelch that kind of scientific inquiry. It really is wrong. It's wrong if the religious people get a hold of it, like if Christianity got a hold of science and said, well, all your conclusions have to lead to God. You know, the whole Galileo thing. 
That was obviously wrong, and it wasn't even biblical, by the way. The Bible never says that the sun revolves around the earth. Some stupid guys in Galileo's time were saying that the Bible said that. It never did say that. They made it up. Okay, well, it's just as stupid now to say that there's nothing to the universe but matter and energy like Dawkins says. He's a crackpot. So you want to decide for yourself what kind of atheist do you want to be if you're an atheist? A rational one who's open to this question, well, what about all this immaterial stuff? Time, life, my thoughts, the laws of math. Those are all immaterial. Why? What does that mean? How did all that immateriality get here? And you see why that's so important. Because it's real obvious that if the universe was always here, it's sustained by this immateriality, whatever it is. If the Big Bang is really what accounts for stuff, well, then something immaterial birthed it. Well, then that would be interesting to find out, don't you think? And what is that immateriality? Is it God? Or is it something else? Is it possible for it to be something else? And if it is, well, what is that something else? And quite frankly, as a Christian, I'd like to know too. And by the way, this inquiry that I'm talking about is something we need to get back to. It's not novel. This question of what is this other immaterial stuff that's been on man's mind for a very long time. The ancient Chinese were speculating about it. The ancient Persians were speculating about it. Okay, especially the ancient Greeks. The ancient Egyptians, they thought they had it all put together. And, you know, for the better part of human history, what they did was they sort of ended up throwing up their hands and saying, well, we can't really account for all this immateriality. And they ascribed it to the so-called gods. But maybe there's another answer. A rational atheist is willing to examine it both ways. An irrational atheist is too threatened, like Dawkins, to examine it both ways. So I'm sorry this ran 37 minutes, but hopefully I gave you a lot of stuff to chew on this time. As an atheist, you might want to ask yourself, am I being irrational? Do I feel threatened? And if you really are threatened, you're going to get all huffy about that question. Typically, the people who ought to hear this kind of information are the ones least inclined to listen to it. And those most inclined to listen to it don't need to know because they can figure it out themselves. But if you're somewhere in the middle, or it just helps you brainstorming, ask yourself this question. Is whatever it is I believe rationally based? If so then you're not threatened by an alternative that's the opposite of what you believe right now. If you feel queasy or nervous or belligerent, then why? I'm dead serious. Why? I'm not threatened by the idea that, well, what if science comes up tomorrow with definitive proof that all this immateriality is definitely not a God thing, but X. Okay. I mean, I'd have to then go to God and say, how come I know you? I mean, the ancients basically presumed God, and they still thought that there was this immateriality that the gods just set in motion. So then I'd have to go to God and say, did you set this in motion? Or am I hallucinating? And what if I were hallucinating? Okay. Just fix it. 
It's not a big deal. Is it a big deal for you? If so, then really you want to kind of consider both sides of the coin. It'll be harder to do so if you feel nervous or upset about doing it. But I submit to you that in any event, what we want to do as like a joint community of Christians and atheists, we want to encourage rationalness, rational thinking on both sides of the aisle. We need rational atheism and rational Christianity, and 90% on both sides are irrational. And it's really a waste of money and time. Billions of dollars are being wasted by irrational arguments on both sides. Everybody talking at each other and not with each other. So I submit to you, we need to encourage ourselves and others to engage in rational atheism, rational Christianity, rational Islam, or whatever. And we need to learn to find out where the irrational ideas are and throw them away. Peace out.